coming up on the payoff. Dana Wenzel Piscopo is absolutely a force of nature. Not only is she in recovery herself, but she creates recovery environments, whether it be mental health or substance abuse, for people in the corporate world. A lot of folks back to work now after COVID, they know what it is like to try to get back into the workspace after being away from so long. Some people, hey, you can remain anonymous, right, have developed certain types of habits, drinking, drug use, whatever it is to medicate during the pandemic. Now you're back into the work culture, the workforce. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate sobriety? How do you get sober? Well, if you're thinking about that stuff, Dana is the podcast for you. Can't wait to share this conversation with you. She's really cool too. She's from King of Prussia outside of Philly. This guy right here, he was from, he's from Brim, 54321. This guy right here, yeah, he knows a little something about being outside of Philadelphia. Kevin Souza. Um, okay. I've, I've like done all my research on you. You're not, it's not hard to find out a lot about you. Um, and that's a good thing, right? It's on, it's on the right side of everything. Uh, and, and all the work you're doing now as an advocate and also what you're doing, you know, in the business world for, for professionals, uh, it's just, for me, it's so important. And I love your, your the podcast, the four sober girls podcast, um, yeah. Yeah, of, of course, I'm going to be a fan of content like that because I've always thought that's kind of how I got into starting. This is because it's great for people to have a place to go, whether they're curious and like you talk about whether you're related to someone uh, who's got a situation like this. But I guess the first thing I want to ask you, because I'm always curious, I sometimes will ask myself this and be reminded, what moves you to share your story and to become open with your journey? Yeah, you know, it, I don't know what it was. It, it was almost like a switch flipped in my head. Um, the same switch that flipped when I went sober. Um, and I felt that in the corporate world, there was no way I was the only one suffering with this or struggling with it or going through this this adventure that i call it i don't i, I don't use journey i use adventure <laughs> um and you know it just i was like i need to do something i there's got to be support out here for other people i need to be that resource that support that i didn't have or didn't know about um and that precipitated a conversation with my general manager of my global business unit at work and uh he was like i don't know where this should land or where this should go but it needs to be somewhere here and i will support you and so, so um, people should know and i could say you work at oracle or for, right i do yep and yep. obviously you talk global you talk a, yes. a place like oracle which it, it, it's moving to me that you know someone in the front office would right away say okay I mean, times have changed, right, Dana? Like, okay, let's find a way to put you to use here. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, my my first big 30,000 foot dream was to bring a life coaching organization to Oracle. Um, and that they weren't they weren't ready for that. They're still not ready for that, right? That is that's something that's that's a that's a dream out in the future that I would love to be able to bring here or to other organizations as well. Um but it it turned it morphed into this this weekly session where people would show up and we would have a monthly theme and we would do weekly sessions on it. People would engage. We would do activities right there on the spot, and it was a it was a safe space for people. Um, I called it Reclaim Your Moxie. Ended up making that a registered trademark, so I could take it elsewhere too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the Reclaim Your Moxie is, is more of a well-being, mental health um, place where people can share and learn about self-awareness and, and confidence and those types of things. And then I also have um, a program that I started about a year and a half ago called SAFE, which is Sobriety Awareness for Everyone. That and that's within Oracle into, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that actually has turned into Oracle Alliance for Recovery. 
So I'm working to get that to be a an affinity a group, an affinity group, like kind of an ERG. I'm getting there. Um, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of work. Um, but we have people. I do addiction awareness. It is um, Alcohol Awareness Month <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we're doing this podcast. So um, I'm happy to share all sorts of statistics and resources with with my crew. So this um, is a beautiful thing. So you've created a space where people in the corporate environment can seek counsel uh, for and, and and you know it sounds like you started under the the broad umbrella of mental health and whether it's substance disorder or whatever. And then you've moved in specifically now to another space, which you call safe. And what has the response been like? I mean, a place like Oracle, was it initially, did you get people coming out right away? Cause we're in a different climate now. And, and uh, there is that stigma, like I mentioned earlier, attached to sobriety, but we're, People like you and I and other folks in sobriety and other folks, you know, that aren't even sober but are involved in the recovery community are working to chip away at that stigma. Have you, have you witnessed that firsthand? Uh, yes, um, because the Oracle Alliance for Recovery was supposed to be a special interest group under one of our, uh, one of our other ERGs, and then we got pulled out. So now I'm back to what I was doing like on my own, a grassroots kind of thing where what is an ERG just for people who don't know, like me, I'm sorry, what is an ERG? Oh, an ERG is an employee resource group. Okay. Okay, cool. So that that's kind of a group that has the, the support of bigger or, you know, the bigger corporation behind you, it gets funding, those types of things. I don't have that yet. I don't have the funding, but I'm working on just getting the word out and getting people involved. Um, I have proposed different things that um, people are trying to push through. So um, I'm hopeful and optimistic <laughs> that uh, we will be doing bigger and better things. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I started the Reclaim Your Moxie. I did an addiction awareness month. And that's when people started coming to me and saying, hey, I'm sober too. Hey, I'm in recovery too. You know, thanks for telling your story. Thanks for being here. Thanks for holding this space. And it just has grown into over 300 people, you know, just grassroots getting the word out that people want the knowledge. They want to learn. They want resources. And it's been an amazing, amazing adventure this, this far. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's peel back and go, go back to your adventure. Uh, cause yeah. a, a lot of times I think someone like you who's sitting in front of us, very polished, almost shiny, uh, it's hard to imagine where, where we've come from. Um, you know, we are talking about a complete 180. somebody who's creating, you know, an environment for people to get well. Uh, and if you were all like me, there was a point in time where you were really needed to get well. Where, 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 where did you grow up? Did you grow up outside of Philadelphia? I did. Okay. I did. I've been here all my life. Um, I've, I've tried to leave a couple of times and <laughs> it worked. <laughs> yeah. It's a great place um, to be. And it's a great, and for me, I grew up right outside Philly. It's a great place to grow up. When, when was your first experience with alcohol or, or a mind altering substance that, that you said, Oh, oh wait a minute. I, I like how this makes me feel. Yeah. Uh, um, oddly, I, I, I didn't start drinking until I was 40. So I, I, wow. you know, I dabbled here and there, but I never liked it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. It always made me sick. Um, and then in 2010 is when I had two relationships kind of blow up in my face all at once. One was professional, one was personal. And, um, I'm like, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta get out of this reality for a little bit. And, um, you know, found the really sugary, icky things to drink <laughs> <laughs> to give me a little bit of a numbing and, um, feel good stuff. And, and it just went downhill from there. <laughs> so, so, so you, so you started to drink at 40 and so it was yeah. almost to seek a relief. Um, yes. because, okay. So the personal and professional, the, the implosion, so to say, was not caused by alcohol, but it was caused by life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes. okay, I need relief from this. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, as you coped with this and you're using the wine or whatever it was to kind of, you know, escape from all this, w what's happening to you as this becomes more consistent? Did you notice for a while? Cause for me, it was like, it was the biggest alcohol and drugs, just the biggest lie. 
that w- I ever told myself um, or, or that, you know, I was made to believe that I, this stuff made me better. This stuff made me more confident, you know, made me better looking. It made me taller, stronger, whatever, you know, I needed to feel. Uh, you know, when did you notice that early on? Was that the vibe? Did you enjoy it for a little while? Oh, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> um, you know, it didn't take me long uh, to to start enjoying it. I, I had just left a marriage. Um, that wasn't one of the relationships that imploded, believe it or not. But um, the dating scene was rough for me. And I hadn't healed from my marriage um, crumbling. I hadn't healed from a lot of other things. So I, it was like masking one thing after another. And I thought the alcohol was making me this cool person. I could finally go out and dance and not care. And, you know, um, the dating scene was so rough and I was attracting people that were like me. And I say that in regards to, I wasn't healthy. So I was attracting not healthy people, um, emotionally, And I didn't realize that at the time. Um, I just thought, man, I have really crappy luck here (laughs) with men. Yeah. Um, You know, and that made me drink more. Um, And then um, I met my my now husband and he has three bonus kids. And, um, you know, I kept drinking and they didn't they they saw it, but I hid it well. I, you know, because I was the just the happy, fun, go lucky drunk person. I wasn't mean, angry, or, you know, weird. Um, and you know, at, so we got, we got together in 2013, we got married 2016 by 2018, 2019. Um, it started to get pretty bad. Um, I was drinking on a daily basis. I was drinking, um, if you're from this area, you know, victory brewing, um, and the gold, the golden monkey was my favorite beer, (laughs) you know, the Belgian, (laughs) Belgian triples. (laughs) I didn't go big or go home. (laughs) I understand Um, very well. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, by 2020, when that pandemic hit, man, that was, I, and I feel for a lot of us, that was a license to, to just go nuts to check with out any kind of substance, because I don't think any of us were equipped on how to handle that type of situation or how long it was going to last. Um, you know, and while I was already drinking pretty much out of control, I was driving under the influence. I was having blackouts. Um, my blackouts got to be two, three days a week. I would get home and not know how I got there. Um, scary stuff, not remembering conversations I had with, with the kids or, or my husband. Um, and you know, it, it got ugly. It it got really, really ugly. And, and, you know, over that stretch of period from 2018 to 2020, I tried to stop several times. (laughs) Um, it just, it, you know, it was one of those white knuckling things you know you're just white knuckling through the sober bit and thinking okay well i can moderate now that i've quit for two months i can do this you know and no it just gets worse yeah oh i know yeah Yeah. and did you find yourself when you actually let me let me go back backwards a little bit uh, before we get into the recovery portion of it because there's a couple things i can relate to Uh, when, when did you get married to your first husband my first husband, we got married in nine. I'm going to show my age here, yeah. 1994. But so you were, um, you, you were a little younger. I mean, you're, you know, that that's a lot of times you see somebody who, or not a lot of times I can just speak from, from what I've learned from just talking to you, you get married and you find yourself in an environment that's comforting and maybe you, you atrophy, right? Like your developmental skills or, you, you know, your ability to cope with certain things because you're in the certain environment. And then, you know, th- the covers are ripped off and, you know, however you came to be there, you're divorced and now you're out in the dating world. And yeah. now it's like, you're almost like you, you, I could relate as being like a teenager going to a dance. Like I, I needed alcohol. And honestly, I needed alcohol for 20 years to connect with other people, especially members of the opposite sex. I mean, <laughs> dating without alcohol was just, it didn't exist to me. And uh, right. it was really one of my conduits to all relationships, which led to most all of them being bad, was alcohol mm-hmm. or drugs. And I never imagined life without it, you know, because this was like providing me with an assist. When you were to those points now, you're talking about 
the end of the pandemic where you're like, uh, you know, I'm blacking out and it's, it's like you said, it's getting ugly. Were, were there, was there a fear around stopping? Like, gosh, if I stop, I won't have this thing that's helped me. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I think there was a, a fear of stopping was, I think the fear of the pain that I was going to have to experience on the, on the flip side of that. And, and the, the feelings, all of the feels, that yeah, all you have the to feels, through, man, they come for you. Once you get, yeah. once you get sober, yeah. um, to, as you go back, I'm going to go back mm-hmm. to my, my ex-husband, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, he struggled with alcohol and that's why I didn't drink is because I was the, the designated driver. So I saw it from the other side and I saw this, like, why can't you just stop? Like, what is your problem? Oh, you know, wow. and now I know yeah. all too well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to get that. No, that, that makes, there, that makes but, a, um, uh, that that's quite an addition to the conversation uh, because it shows what a lot of times we still hear, which is a part of that stigma, right? That I'll reach back and grab that again. Like, why can't you just stop? You know, you who ultimately couldn't stop were asking that question to your husband. Why can't you just stop? And honestly, as an alcoholic, that sounds, I get that. You know, I get that. Like it's, I get the progression of the disease and I also get, uh, you know, not being able to understand why somebody can't just stop. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. I mean, you don't, you don't realize it until you're on the other side. And I think that automatically helps with empathy and compassion and understanding and, um, taking a step back to realize you don't know what's going on on the other side. You don't know how people can or cannot handle things. So how did Dana stop? No, Dana stopped with a chicken <laughs> cheesesteak. <laughs> oh, really? What? Tell me what happened. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so about two weeks before I stopped, um, I, I ate a chicken cheesesteak. And um, I, I am a master vegan lifestyle coach and educator as well. So I am vegan. <laughs> um, and that pretty much just did me in. I was like, all right my morals were just out the window at that point. I was like, if I could do this, what else am I going to do under the influence? And it, it wasn't the blackouts. It wasn't driving drunk or, or any of those things that stopped me. It was the, thank God for the chicken cheesesteak. Right. I mean, yes. It, 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 sometimes it's not the bears. It's, it's the mosquitoes. <laughs> you know what? I said, what sometimes it's my sponsor says it's not, it's not always the bears. It's the mosquitoes sometimes. And that's, you know, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. So the chicken cheesesteak, yeah. you have that and you're saying, Hey, wh- wh- where am I going with this? This is something that's Absolutely. been so being a vegan has been so important to me and I've thrown that out the window. And so yep. the two weeks between the, the chicken cheesesteak and, and finally stopping, how, how did you, because a big part of stopping is developing a toolbox for those coping skills yes. that you had either never developed or put aside when you started to drink. I mean, you, you, I don't know, you do, but how do you reach back and find, find those coping skills when you stop? Yeah. Um, well, I was white knuckling it, um, through those first couple of weeks, the, the, the two weeks between the chicken cheese steak and when I stopped was I'm like that type of person that needs to pick a date and like prepare myself. <laughs> that's what my so brother Kevin was... did. He's sober and he and his wife circled a date on the calendar and the guy stopped yeah. that day. It was late October and I think 2010. Yeah. Or 2009. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what I needed to do. I needed to just, you know, the, the, the switch was flipped already in the head, but I was like, all right, I'll just get in all your drinking right now in these last two weeks. <laughs> um, you know, and then, just be done with it. And I remember it was the weekend before Labor Day. So, you know, five days into my sobriety and I'm sitting out on the deck, you know, having a, you know, a a dinner with my husband and um, I'm like, can I just have one? And he's like, no, you know what will happen. He's like, you'll have one and you won't remember the whole weekend. (laughs) So, and he was right. He was right. So, Um, you know, I consumed all of the information I possibly could. Um, and by the end of September, I was in a recovery coaching program to become a recovery coach. Um, so this has been four months almost we're talking about, right? I mean, about that. Wow. 
A, yeah, uh, it was a month. Oh yeah, Labor Day. I was thinking Memorial Day. So one month. Wow. One month. Okay. And be- because that's what I need. I need to immerse myself in the knowledge and the education. And then that's what keeps me going through things. That's what I did when I became vegan. I, I jumped into health coaching. I jumped into wellness because I knew the knowledge would get me there. Um, How much of a struggle so, with that? I got to ask about this. Being somebody who's a wellness coach and who knows all this stuff about health and here you are drinking yourself yeah. into oblivion every night. Yeah, and and that's why my healthing my health coaching didn't take off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you think if you think about it, you know there was that black cloud that was hanging over me that I didn't realize, yeah. right? Because everybody drank. That's what I'm a I'm an ultra distance runner. That's what we do. You know, you run 50 miles and you go have the three or four beers because you're carb loading. Yeah. You know, so it's it it's so prevalent in our in our lives. You know, especially in America. Um, that drinking is good for you. Drinking is healthy to an extent um, that you don't think about, you know, the, the actual poison that you're putting in your body. So, so you get, so you start to, you know, obviously you start in this program. So, you know, so now you're in it. What did you learn uh, about sobriety and about yourself when you entered into this, this coaching program and you really started to embrace uh, the adventure Right. You started to yeah. embrace the wellness, the real wellness side of it. No yeah. more white knuckling. Yeah. Um, I realized that sobriety and recovery are two separate things <laughs> and they're very different. You can have sobriety and recovery, um, you know, but I, I think there's a lot of people out there that are white knuckling their way through sobriety and not taking it on as a lifestyle. And it's it's that's what it is. You have to change your life to, to really embrace it, to understand that, you know, some of us just can't drink anymore. And that's what I found. I found that through my coach, my coaching certification program, the knowledge that what it does to your brain, what, how it changes your brain chemistry, um, you know, how it makes you think differently, like you're not in control of, of those things anymore. (laughs) And it's, it was very interesting to me and very terrifying that I did not need or want to go back to those types of things. Gave me a lot of tools. Um, and it, you know, we had to work through these activities that we would be giving our, our clients. So we were actually working on ourselves as we were working through this program. And I think that's what really helped me. I coached myself. Kind yeah. Of. Did you know, um, so, so any, any 12 step work or, or no? Okay. No. Yeah, no. And that's no. what this, that's kind of what this podcast is about. It's not about one certain way or particular way to stop. It's about all the different ways that people can actually stop and live a free life. Like, like you are living. What are some of the things that you learned? Some of the tools, if somebody, let's say, gets sober, stops drinking, um, and is faced with an event, maybe a month in, um, you know, what kind of tools, what kind of exercises um, did you uh, wrap your mind around that you could employ yourself? Yeah, um, breathing. Breathing is always a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, breathing. Um, I finally learned how to meditate. Um, you know, even if it's just 10 minutes a day to start, it calms the whole nervous system. It calms your brain so you can just be, you know, it. Let your mind go where it needs to be, but just be for 10 minutes and and take in that deep breathing. That was a big one. And um, the one that I am always talking about is my movie reel. I play the movie reel in my head. What happens when I take that first drink? That that goes on to the second, third and fourth drinks. And then what happens at the end of that movie reel? You know, you're passed out on the couch. You're driving home, oh, out, you're this, that, or the other thing. And I don't ever want to be there. So for me, that was a very, very important tool in the beginning was playing that movie reel in my head to the end of what I didn't want to be, you know, at that point. How have you grown in recovery? Cause I'm, I'm imagining, you know, you're, I had a, a really rough bottom, right? Like I, uh, It doesn't seem like you, I mean, emotionally, right? But it seems like you still had your husband, you're still, you know, employed and stuff like that. 
Yeah. So, so how, well, I mean, but you're not, it's different for everybody, you know, and it doesn't yeah. mean a lot of times people can compare themselves out. Well, I still have this or that. I did that too. So I didn't have anything, you know, uh, yeah. luckily I was still walking around where I was able to turn it over at some point, but how have you grown, you know, in, in recovery, in sobriety? I have grown into, you know, somebody that I don't even recognize anymore. Um, I have grown in love for myself, um, self-awareness for myself. Um, professionally, I was promoted two times in 10 months. Um, I have been asked to do many different workshops and different lines of business for Oracle um, with U.S. Benefits, with NetSuite. I've done, um, I did a 30-minute affirmation workshop where over 400 people showed up. Like, oh. <laughs> How does that even happen? <laughs> um, you know, I'm on the board for the United Suicide Survivors International. Um, I'm on, I'm the chair for a research project on the Construction Industry Institute for Mental Health in the Construction Industry. Um, wow, that's a tough speaking. that's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah a lot absolutely. of a lot of tough guys and a lot of people who you know probably. Yes. Yeah, it's just like athletes per se, like that I kind of work. It's tough for people to show that vulnerability. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I, so I work in the construction and engineering global business unit at Oracle. So I'm I'm surrounded with, with the construction industry. Um, so, you know, that's- How do you I get through of, to the construction worker that his whole uh, life has worked his ass off and every day is at a couple beers and he's got a good life for his family and he, you know, but, but, he, but he needs to stop. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard, right? That's where the peer support comes in. And that's what I'm trying to promote is the peer support, you know, just, it starts with one person and I've seen it. I've seen it throughout the construction industry. Um, there's an organization out there, the um, Associated Builders and Contractors Organization. And the one gentleman that I work with there um, closely, they have a total workers health and you know, they train the safety managers in the different construction companies, their members, you know, they, they incorporate the mental health now into the safety programs. It's not just don't fall off the crane, you know, <laughs> or get yourself injured. It, it is a total workers health kind of thing. It, it's heart health, it's body health, it's physical health, it's emotional health. And the younger generation I think they are a lot more open to it than the older generation. And they're, those are the ones that, you know, you leave that stuff in the truck before you get to the job site. And those are the the ones that are a little bit harder to reach, but, um, I would imagine the know, reason I, I asked, I would imagine that's just, just a tough job. I mean, it just, it, yeah. You know, yeah. A couple other yeah. things. I know you got, you got, uh, places to go, people to see, but I want to yeah. just wrap up with a couple more uh, things that you've mentioned. You talk about numbers um, what are some of the statistics that would shock people, even people that are alcoholic, people that are sober, or that are listening to this? And because, uh, because I, whenever I don't do too much, I have my own research that I've done, right? That I know it doesn't yeah. work for me. Um, and I'm a 12 step guy and other things too, you know, but, um, what are, so I don't talk about statistics too much, but I think that they are, you know, I'm a sports guy and I, statistics back up a, a lot of the, you know, a lot of information uh, and points that are made and their numbers don't lie really. Uh, so that's a long way of saying, what are some statistics that jump out at people about recovery yeah. and about uh, addiction? Um, putting me on the spot with numbers here. Yeah, I mean, well, ball, yeah, anything you can <laughs> yeah, ballpark, no, Dean, no. you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think some of the numbers that really shocked me were that 70% of Americans have some sort of substance that use some sort of substance in the working space. Um, really? I thought that, yeah, <laughs> that, that blew my mind. And that I think the number was $696 billion a year is lost in the corporate and work space due to substance use from their employees. So whether that's absenteeism, presenteeism, going to rehab, um, calling in sick, you know, family members that they have to take care of that have addiction issues and things like that. It is a huge problem. Um, 
and the numbers are huge, you know, they, and they keep rising. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we're seeing even higher numbers because now people need to go back to work and they're not sure how to navigate all because of that. Because sometimes, that, I mean, that brings on next, yeah, there's extra been stresses. like self-medication at home because yes. a lot of times, like you mentioned, people, it did a number on all of us. I was sober, but I mean, it just did a, it did a number. I can remember when I was, you know, I didn't get sober till 10 years after this, but I remember 9-11 and I lived in the New York area. And I remember that was like a great excuse excuse really it was i mean nobody knew what to do there was nothing to cope people were scared and i was just like let's go and every night um i was never the same after that now it's in my family i was gonna be a drunk whether i was gonna get sober or not you know but i do uh, coming back to civilian life or whatever you want to call it after the pandemic has got to be tough for people to navigate going back into the workspace are, are you helping them do that at oracle that's what I, that's what the reclaim your moxie is all about. That's what people come. They come to learn boundaries and and you know we work on feelings and emotions. This month we're working on humor as a stress reliever. I'm still trying to figure out how to do that one without offending a lot of people. Um, <laughs> but Good luck. We, you know we do strengths and values. We do um, goal setting. You know June is our new fiscal year, so we always do a new you, a new year. Um, and we, we just do a lot of those types of things, um, and challenges and it, with the, or program that's all focused on, you know, substance use and resources and, and those types of things. So, yeah, we do a lot. I want to wrap up with this one more thing. What do you tell somebody that is going back into their corporate environment or, or somebody that is just getting sober that has to live and stay in that corporate environment how do you tell them it's okay to to not drink it's okay and 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 here's how you can yeah it's it's i always say this it's okay to be not okay <laughs> um and i think that's one of our biggest statements in the recovery arena right is is um you take it day by day and if you know today you can only do 40 percent, you're still doing the best that you're doing and it's better than you would have done if you didn't do anything at all or you picked up right so it's you've got to just keep moving step by step by step and day by day by day and just take it a day at a time you know that that one day at a time it that's out there for a reason right and um use your tools gain your tools right like look for things that you can do to add to your toolbox add that movie reel, add, you know, the breathing, add affirmations, um, add people that are your support, right? If you are having a tough day because you're back in the office, who can you reach out to, to talk about it? You know, who can you just vent to and go, oh my God, this sucks, you know, yeah. or, you know, I just need somebody to listen to me for two minutes. Um, you know, and if you're- Make if that you're phone company, call. Talk yeah. to that person. It can change the entire course of your day. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And a bunch of and, phone calls you know, make a bunch of days. And the next thing you know, you're waking up and you've been sober for some time and your life is together. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and if there's programs that work, use them. Use your EAP. Use your benefits to your best advantage. Um, I know there's a lot of us that are reluctant to do that, but... It, it's worth it. They're there for you for a reason, yeah. you know, and, and reach out to somebody in, in your work environment that you can trust. Yeah. Anything, anything else, Dana? This has been a, a, a an adventure. <laughs> it has yeah. been. It's, it yeah. has been. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just, it, I, you know, I'm not going to say that if I can do it, you can do it because it, that's, you know, it's all relative to each one of us. And, um, you know, I, I think if you are thinking about getting sober or wanting to be sober, find some sober groups, find some sober, curious information. There's a ton of it out there and you have to be ready. So, you know, really be open to being ready you know, and being open and wrapping your arms around yourself, you know, give yourself the gift of sobriety. I love it. And I love be open to being ready. Yeah. I've never heard that. I love it. Dana, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, this is, 
I, I'll, I'll put uh, you know the link to your podcast and the link to your LinkedIn. All right, I'll put I'll put it in the show notes. Um, awesome. And and I'll send you this. This will probably probably do like uh, go up later tomorrow probably. Oh great! Thank yeah? you. And if you want, awesome. send me send me like your favorite headshot, and okay, I'll use that we'll one. Will do. Yeah, but thank yeah, you we'll so do. much for your time. This is long overdue. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you too so very much. All right, you have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Dana. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Network production.